Another edition of Beat the Closing Number presented by TheLines.com. You can follow The Lines on Twitter at TheLinesUS. You can follow Mo Nuara, our MLB betting savant on Twitter as well. Two W's at Mo Nuara. X, Twitter, whatever Elon Musk wants to call it these days. And you can follow me at Eli Herskovich. Mo, we are 22-9 and nine with spreads and totals in the 2023 NFL season. How you feeling after a sweep of the board yesterday for both of our bets? All of our bets. Good recovery week for me, for sure. Uh, as far as NFL goes, anyways. Maybe struggled on some other things. But, yeah, this week was good, man. I mean, I definitely had the board very well read, I felt like. And, uh, obviously, uh, Broncos easily came home for you. And I'm blanking on what your other one was, but I think they were pretty easy winners. Panthers was interesting. Second half, they controlled both sides of the ball. But after that fourth and goal where they didn't score, um, for some reason, they decided to, ball, to run the ball three straight times and then set up, a, again, a scoreless situation inside the not only the red zone, but inside the one-yard line. I wasn't feeling great about it, but that got home. C.J. Stroud was not who we thought he was, at least what the market thought he was and our boss, Steven Andres thought he was, but commanders pushed Panthers hit and Broncos hit for me too. Yeah. Little disappointed commanders didn't come home. I think it probably should have based on absolutely at least their offensive output for sure. I mean, they moved the ball very, very effectively against Philly. So it's tough not to cover seven when you score 31 points, man, but <laughs> I guess we'll have to take a push. And how did your individual bats go? Just going one by one. Yeah, I had some other uh, good ones. Arizona. Some people might say I got lucky there. I would say I was unlucky to be in that position. Ooh. But, uh, you know, whatever on that one, I think. Uh, I-, I think I was right that Arizona – did catch them a little bit sleepy in the first half. It, it was a sloppy, sloppy half for Baltimore, for sure. Um, Definitely sloppy, but can we just go minute by minute, play by play in the final? That what? sounds time consuming, but go ahead. It does, it does sound time consuming. So the Cardinals score a touchdown. This is Mo, granted he had Cardinals plus nine and a half. I'm glad he cashed. I'm not hating on the guy. Cardinals score a touchdown with what? Under a minute to go. Go for two and whiff. Get the onside kick and recover somehow, miraculously, and we'll get to what this could happens have happened. Roughly seven percent of the time since they changed the rules now, I think. Exactly. So you get the onside kick. They kick a field goal down ten with thirty seconds left and miss. Cardinals get called for a false start. So it's not like Baltimore could decline the penalty. And they re kick, cash the field goal. And your bet hits. Listen, I'm glad it cashed, but I don't think you're allowed to complain about any other bet for maybe the next year plus after cashing Cardinals and Bucks. Bucks was very fortunate for sure. They should have lost by a lot, I think. But <laughs> at the same time, man, if they had anyone pulling the strings with an ounce of sense... It, they probably would have had a good chance to cover. I just cannot believe week after week that they can just keep plunging into the line every single first down and not see a problem. I, it's just like baffles It's not me. Byron Leftwich anymore. You can't blame him. Yeah, I mean, I, I there's definitely a top-down edict coming down here from, I think, Todd Bowles. But, yeah, this is a major, major problem. I mean, yeah, if you had, you know, the Titans O-line and – 2018 Derrick Henry run the ball on first down all you want man it's probably going to do you some good but this is not going well so maybe try throwing the ball guys it's possible it could work believe it or not you are allowed to pass on first down (laughs) crazy concept over to another crazy concept before we get into some week nine takes and if you're new to beat the closing number give us a thumbs up on youtube bring the bell Subscribe, rate, and review if you're listening to us on the audio-only version on Apple, Spotify, wherever you find your favorite podcast. We'll go through some of the biggest line movement, at least in comparison to the look-ahead lines, and discuss four games that stand out to us on the Week 9 NFL slate. But recapping Week 8, 
And you mentioned Washington and Philly. We both had the commanders. They pushed. Thankfully, Jamison Crowder made a diving catch. And also somewhat thankful that the Eagles went for or got the extra point instead of going for two. Kind of fortunate because I was getting a little worried that we were going to have a bad beat there with Washington if Philly decided to go for the two-point conversion. Kind of grateful that didn't happen. Even though maybe if they whiff, we cover if Washington loses by six. But one of those situations where I felt like we were going to be on the wrong end of the stick. So Eagles score a touchdown with under two minutes left on a third and two. I'm watching the replay as I speak. 150 to go. They score a touchdown. DeAndre Swift has the opportunity to slide. And this looks like the tush-push play. But instead, they run a pitch to Swift. He goes on the outside and scampers in. If you slide, game over. If Washington, but Washington did score with over a minute left. If they get the onside kick and they get the benefit of positive variance like the Cardinals did, could have been overtime. Eagles could have lost that game very conceivably. I'm shocked. A, you brought this up in our Slack chat before we did the podcast today that why would you run that play? Why would you use... I don't understand it. Nick it's, Sirianni... Yeah. Putting that on tape is... Like, you want to pull that out in, like, a big moment. Like, the Philly special playoffs. for the Eagles in the Super Bowl. You know? Like, you, you want to spring the element of surprise when somebody in some huge spot, when the other team is going all in to stop your pet play. Like, why would you show your counter in a game that's basically over? I, I am just baffled by this. It was over. You you slide. DeAndre Swift goes down, or or you just run the tush push, and it's it's over. It was third down, so they could have even kicked a field goal if they didn't get the tush push. Brotherly chef, whichever way you want to call call it, or in traditional terms, a quarterback sneak. I am baffled. Forget about the play call. Go down. Game over. What are you, it felt like to me, the Eagles, and not that we're trying to, I know this is a a betting show, obviously, but it felt like Philly was kind of upset that they weren't blowing Washington out. I know that might sound dumb, but I, I don't think it is. And you look at yards per play, as you alluded to, Washington outgained Philly by nearly a full yard per play. If the officials get a call right on the Devontae Smith Fourth down drop or should have been called a drop if Ron Rivera challenges it. Rivera just continues to make, speaking of baffling decisions. I, I mean, Washington gets the ball back at midfield up seven in the second half if he throws the red flag and doesn't hold it back. When else are you going to use that? So stupid. I, I, the Both sides in this game were ridiculous in a lot of different ways. Sam Howell, how about... Can can Terry McLaurin catch a football? I, I just I just can't believe those two drops on on the possession previous to the DeAndre Swift touchdown, where Washington probably had a shot to. I mean, I don't want to say they would have gone down the field to tie the game, but then we're in a position to cover if the Eagles just go down and get a field goal rather than a touchdown. But man, just coaching on both sides, decision making on both sides, negative variance in our direction, was not fun. Of course, the Eagles didn't score twice inside the 10-yard line. That benefited us. But yards per play were in our favor. So I felt like we were on the right side. And Eagles coaching, this is going to burn the man in the playoffs. Yeah, there was a lot of odd situations, a lot of drop skis as well around the league this week. So, uh, yeah, there was... There was definitely a lot of all that and, and some some weird re- officiating moments for sure. I, I thought, you know, I know I, I don't think the Chiefs were going to win because they played like complete ass basically. But that double clutch in the end zone on that touchdown, I don't think that was a catch. Like, and they went to review and said that it call stands, but I think he pretty clearly bobbled it and then and then the second foot came out of bounds. So there was definitely some weird calls uh, and some. Uh, like I said, a lot of big drops in Chicago, man. <laughs> God. That, yeah, where they were, was that I mean, they could have down? made it a game. They could have made it a game if he if he caught that touchdown. Like, the yeah, whole game might have changed. The, the first half. Yeah. On their third or, I think their second or third possession of the game. Yeah, that bomb. I mean, first of all, he just fell down. 
untouched. But second, he fell down right where the ball came. So it still should have been caught. It still could have been caught when he fell down. Yeah. He just bobbled and dropped it. And we'll, we'll get his name. He is he is a something, to be fair, if you're a regular Something listener. V-less. Yeah, something, something V-less. Yeah, that was just... Was that... Oh, I think that was the play before the... Was it to... No, that was... I'm going through play-by-play play here. I'm trying to... The punt? Let's see here. I don't think I could find the play. All right. Well... Something Vilas. We'll go with that. I don't even think that's how you pronounce his name. Just thinking about Bears roster and me being in Chicago and the pronunciation. I've heard it before, but it doesn't matter. Just questionable calls, questionable negative variance, as you're alluding to, although the Chargers dominated that son of that football game. Justin Herbert was throwing all over the Bears defense. With yeah, the exception of course. Of- yeah. I'm just saying, and, if they don't fall into a massive negative script there, it could have been a different game. I had the Chargers, so this benefited me hugely, but it's just possible. Well, Chris Collinsworth continuously saying that Justin Fields should study Tyler Bajan, Tyson Bajan. There's nothing else. There's nothing to say about that. This is like, this. that was just like in week four. Zach Wilson was the second covey to Brett Favre. During that Chiefs game. I mean, and then you watch Giants Jets yesterday. Broadcasters, negative variants, officiating. That's what you get summed up in the NFL in 2023. Just horrifying at all different levels. But as I mentioned off the top, week nine, most importantly, to the batters watching this and listening to this line movement from the look ahead line. We'll get into that. If you're curious about any of our bets in real time, where you could find them this week before our Thursday edition of beat the closing number, head over to head over to the discord channel. The link is over at the lines.com in the top right hand corner. You can head over to the rules server in our discord to get notifications. When we place bets in real time, check out Mo's week nine survivor guide as well on the lines.com homepage. And my college basketball power ratings are up on the site as well. Officially a week away from college basketball 2023-2024 season tipping off and a couple futures that I touched on in the power ratings too. So be sure to check that out. Looking at six or so games here, Mo, before we get into the four that have our attention, just the biggest line movement juxtaposed to the look ahead line. Rams went from about a point, point and a half, Road favorite on the look ahead to now a three-point road dog at the Packers with Matt Stafford unlikely to play. New England up from about two, two and a half to three. And I would expect, honestly, a bigger shift if Washington ends up moving some key pieces on their defensive front. Not that I equate a defensive lineman to much against the spread. But if we're talking, let's say they somehow move Sweat, Young, and one of their other significant pieces in that defensive front that gets generates a decent amount of pressure. We could see this tick up to three and a half. And also just with new England at home, new England has gotten the market's attention a ton this season on a game by game basis. Cleveland from eight and a half to seven, seven and a half against Arizona, Baltimore up from four and a half to five and a half against the Seahawks. The Eagles stay three point home favorites against Dallas. Be sure to tune into our Thursday edition of Beat the Closing Number for more on that game. And the Chargers up from one and a half to three at the Jets on Monday Night Football. If you're interested in betting any NFL Week 9 action and don't have an account with BetMGM Sportsbook, you can use bonus code THELINES, that's one word, the lines to get up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet loses. Mo kicking things off with the Titans and the Steelers on Thursday Night Football. Sounds like a terrible game to watch, but that's why we bet. Steelers are two and a half, three point home favorites. Total 36 and a half, one of the lowest totals of the season for a good reason. Kenny Pickett unlikely to play in this one. At least that's what the reports say. As of Monday, suffered that rib injury against Jacksonville. Means we're going to get Mitch Trubisky against Will Levis. And by the way, Will Levis, I know a lot of people will harp on the four long touchdown passes he threw against the Falcons, but 15 of 20, 81 passing yards, 3.2 yards per pass attempt. 
negative 0.6 EPA per drop back outside of those three long pa- three long passes. Yes, they were impressive, but it's not like we're going to get that kind of busted coverage. Not that they were all a product of busted coverage, but not like he's going to see that sort of script necessarily play out on a week-by-week basis. But I digress. So just throwing that out there. Pittsburgh has allowed the seventh fewest EPA per play this season, although Micah Fitzpatrick could miss this game with a hamstring injury, and Steelers' defensive backfield may not have Levi Wallace, who missed the Jacksonville game with a foot injury as well. Pittsburgh, 4-3, and three, with a negative 34-point differential. <laughs> Mo, what say you for this Thursday Night Football matchup? I like Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm irritated that I missed the two and a half. I was staring at that in disbelief this morning. Um, uh, Albeit it was like minus 120. So I did add minus three cheap uh, plus 100 into my account this morning. A little bit after that, which I still think is good. Um, The look ahead here was like minus four and a half, I think. And I thought that was a fair line. So I'm happy to get the Steelers. At minus three, and I like the Titans this week, um, but this is a much different situation than that. Okay, that game, you had a young quarterback about to make his first start with two weeks to prepare with a head coach who has historically done very well uh, with extra time to prepare off the bye. So it was an ideal situation aside from maybe facing a pretty solid defense in Atlanta. And now a short week facing a good defense that's mad and heading home looking for a bounce back w at home i think this is a dream spot to buy the steelers i I, they can get after the quarterback we know that levis is going to be under pressure the titans are their o-line stinks they're 29th in adjusted sack rate and they're facing a, a strong defense that has played one of the toughest schedules in the NFL. The Steelers are probably a better team than they look like on paper. I don't know who's going to be playing quarterback, and I really don't care. I don't think there's much of a difference between these two quarterbacks. Um, so, yeah, I think just a, a really good spot to fade the Titans when people are excited about them, clearly, since the market moved. Levis looked good. I thought he played a good game, like... I know that there was some ugly stats, but overall, eye test to me was pretty good. PFF also was a fan of his work. I think they gave him like a 78. I think that's legitimate. I think he played a solid game, but this is a much different and much tougher situation. So, yeah, I love the Steelers in this spot. Also, Pittsburgh could be getting back Cam Hayward, who was designated for return off injured reserve on Thursday. And Tomlin said earlier this morning, as we record this on Monday, October 30th, happy early Halloween. I'm sure a lot of you celebrated over the weekend. No, you actually celebrated over the weekend. Why don't you share with our audience what you wound up doing? I went to go see Rocky Horror Picture Show. I had never seen it before. It was an interesting experience. Pretty fun. People don't know about it. You can look it up. It's a really like old, campy, cheese ball movie. Everyone goes to the movie and yells the lines or something. I it's it's funny. It's a funny experience. Um, but yeah, I, one thing I would real quick want to throw out though. I know so Cam Hayward thing might be canceled out. Unfortunately, they might be losing Minka Fitzpatrick. So just just yeah. to note that. Sure. Yeah, but. To your point about Steelers' pass rush, Hayward contributes there. He contributes, I mean, he's their best run stopper. So you get him back against a a rookie quarterback in his second start on a short week, even without Fitzpatrick. I'm with you. If I was betting this game, I don't think I'm going to have a play on Thursday Night Football. I try to stay away from Thursday Night games just because of, you want to, we touched on the variance on, on Sundays. How about variance on a short week? That could happen, but... Getting Hayward back would be pretty big. Also, not that it matters a ton, but Anthony McFarland also could be back for this game. Literally means nothing to me handicapping it, but it's worth a note just for the sake of injury reporting. All right, so any other notes for Titan Steelers before we move on, though? Nope. Uh, just, I would say, I, I one thing, I will say it's minus three. Wouldn't be surprised to see this close minus three and a half. I know it's disgusting to lay points like that in a game like this, but I just think the Titans offense is in a really rough spot here. Titans would be an extremely trendy dog 
after what Levis did against the Falcons in his first ever start. Talk about a small sample size. Now going up against Pittsburgh, even without Fitzpatrick. If they get Hayward back, that's a big addition considering all the issues with this Titans offensive line going up against Watt, Hayward, and the rest of that Steelers defensive front. On to one of the best games on the slate regular season-wise all year. Kansas City against Miami in Germany. This one taking place early Sunday morning, I believe 9.30 a.m. Eastern. Kansas City was minus four on the look at. It's now down to two and a half pretty much across the board. Total of 50 and a half. And you mentioned this with the Broncos game. So let's get into that game a little bit. Just for context, Mahomes with 5.19 yards per pass attempt. Kansas City with five turnovers, three fumbles. By the way, Denver came into that game with the league's worst fumble luck, recovering just about 20% of their fumbles. So I would say they got positive variance. And me being a Broncos backer for pretty much all year, I finally got some breaks back in the Denver Broncos. But Kansas City outgained Denver 4.8 to 3.7 yards per play. And also Mahomes dealing with the flu and a lot of hand gashes. I mean, the cameras were all over that throughout the game. 40 rush attempts for Denver, though. I will say that was uh, something that I touched on with a handicap. Denver's ability to run the football on this Chiefs exploitable run defense, especially without Bolton, and Denver having the slowest tempo in neutral situational pace. So from that perspective, I think the handicap was fair. You're not going to get five turnovers. You're not going to B plus four in the turnover department often, but just from the standpoint that Denver had pretty much, I mean, they had the worst turnover luck in the league coming into that game, fumble luck wise. So I was happy with the result. I know you being a Chiefs fan, Mo, any takeaways? Not really. Just basically. Sky Moore a, sucks? Yeah. How about I mean, that? Whatever. That's, we knew that probably, but uh, <laughs> just an absolute dime on fourth down and just. He's yeah. just he's just inept, man. I mean, I, I had some hopes for him still coming into the season, although he was terrible last year. But I still was like, okay, it's way too early to give up on somebody with that sort of draft pedigree that a lot of sharp people liked, you know, as a draft prospect. But obviously, he's pretty bad. And uh, this was just a total sleepwalk stinker. Chiefs just forgot to show up for a pro football game, took a dump at midfield and got back on the plane and then headed home. I mean, it happens, you know, I, it sucks, but it happens. <laughs> it does. And Miami on the flip side, outgained new England 5.3 to 4.3 yards per play. Kendrick Bourne tearing his ACL, just a nugget for the Patriots and going back to that Washington, new England game. Speaking of absentees, if Washington, Washington is going to be without, at least one of their defensive linemen if this trade does go down potentially with sweat to the Falcons. But ton of season-ended injuries, significant ones for the Patriots. Christian Gonzalez, Judon, and now Bourne out for the year. Get-right game potentially for Mahomes against this Miami secondary, even with Jalen Ramsey now quote-unquote healthy. Miami allowing the or ranks number 24 in dropback success rate allowed. But then on the flip side, kind of similar to this, or at least the script, not that it's going to be the exact same by any means, just because Miami plays much more of tempo than Denver does, but exploitable Chiefs run defense against one of the best scheme rushing offenses that McDaniels runs with that zone rush scheme. That is a little bit of a concern for me. Even with this line, and you're getting a cheaper number on Kansas City, assuming Mahomes is healthy for this run one. And then, last note I have down, of course, it is the Tyree Kill Bowl going up against his former team. Yeah, we'll absolutely, drop man. I, I think both sides have this game very much circled and have been looking forward to this for some time. That was probably another reason the Chiefs took a dump on the field uh, yesterday. But... Uh, I should note that I think I saw all two and a halfs on the look aheads, so I'm not sure where you were seeing those, but I was seeing two and a halfs when I wrote the article last week. Uh, but I thought that was fair. I still think this is probably fair, although I will say I like this matchup for Kansas City, I think. Second in pressure rate, we know Tua's game really falls apart when he's off platform. Uh, you, the left side of this Dolphins line is terrifying. Right now, Teron Armstead is on IR. They have Kendall Lamb, who is a decent swing tackle, but obviously not going to hold up 
overall or he would be a starter. Um, and then Austin something Jackson, by the way, was really good against the Patriots. Yeah, like the Just right side is still okay, but then they have yeah. something called Cotton is starting on the left side. He committed multiple penalties in the game I watched against the Eagles, uh, and I believe he is a backup as well. And you yeah, know, Eichenberg got gashed a ton this year in terms of pass protection, so they had to make the change there. And like you said, there isn't a better option behind him. And you know, if anybody in the world is going to sniff out any weakness in your offensive line and bring specific targeted blitzes to spin that player's head, it's going to be Steve Spagnolo. We saw what he did to uh, a decimated Cincinnati offensive line in the playoffs last year. He made them look silly. And you know he's going to bring the heat on these guys that are question marks. Um, but... Yeah, on the other hand, is anybody going to catch the ball for Kansas City? I mean, overall, I like this matchup for them, but there's definitely some variables here. You got Mahomes, like you said, getting over the flu, and then and then it's always a random variable of how teams are going to handle the trip to Europe, especially teams like... I mean, I think the Dolphins maybe went last year. I can't remember. They Two might years have played ago, in I think, London. against okay. Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah, I remember that game, I think. Uh, but I don't recall the chiefs having one i don't think so um yeah it just you don't know how these teams are going to handle it so anything could happen where there's a flat spot for either one of these teams even though it shouldn't be but the travel could could make it that way so i, I do kind of lean towards the chiefs but i don't think i'm going to be playing this one and i don't know where the line's going to move but i kind of think it's going to stay at two and a half just to your point you were right two and a half look ahead last week Preseason look ahead was four. So rightful adjustment on Miami from that standpoint. And also with this Dolphin secondary, I don't think Xavier Howard or their their safety is supposed to be back for this game either. So even with Ramsey coming back yesterday, and he did have the pick of Mac Jones, but that was just a terrible, terrible pass. So There was a couple dreadful interceptions in that game. Tua threw a disgusting one as well. He wasn't good either. Yeah, his... That kind of looked like last year too, just in terms of, this, of decision making. I'm with you. I'm with you there. By the way, before we get into the third game that we're going to discuss, some breaking news in the NFL: Seahawks are trading for Leonard Williams on the on the defensive front. Any quick takeaways? No, I mean, well, of course, my takeaway is the same as it would always be. I am zero percent surprised. Pete Carroll loves him some defense. He does. Legion of Boom, just going back. I mean, that was secondary too, but yeah, getting pressure on the quarterback. They, I mean, they needed help up front in a big way. So I'm not surprised they made the move for a fourth and a fifth rounder just for context. Yeah, and I think Leonard Williams has a pretty rich contract, if I'm recalling. Or I might be thinking of Dexter Lawrence. So Both Dexter Lawrence is, I think, the one who just signed a huge one last offseason maybe, but... Yeah, you don't want to usually be paying multiple interior D linemen that sort of money. So, uh, especially with the Giants totally out of it, yeah, no surprise that they would want to move that sort of money. And um, on the other end, I th- I think, dude, the Seahawks have a legit shot to dethrone the Niners. I think you were on this in the preseason. I kind of wish you would have waited till three weeks in because you could have got a sick price. But uh, they are definitely live. I- they're ahead of the Niners now. And the Niners have multiple injury concerns. Uh, so Seahawks definitely have a shot here. They need to start playing more consistent and protect their passer. If they can figure out a way to give Geno some consistent pockets, I think they're going to be a good team. We'll touch on the Niners once we get to Bill's Bengals for the fourth and final game here on Beat the Closing Number. Just looking back at Bengals Niners from week eight. But third game, though, another interesting one because it was confirmed just about an hour ago. Kirk Cousins officially out for the rest of the season. Not that that's a surprise, but with the torn ACL against the Packers, despite Minnesota covering as, what, one-point favorites, one-and-a-half-point road favorites, closing at that number yesterday. And this line has spiked in a big way. Look at line was Atlanta minus one-and-a-half. It's now up to five, pretty much across the board. Total of 37 and a half. It could be Jaron Hall or Minnesota could wind up trading for a quarterback before this game. And we also don't know who's going to be starting for the Falcons under center either. Taylor Heineke got 
what the back half of the game yesterday against Tennessee and there were reports that Ritter could have come back who knows if that's actually the case but dealing with concussion like symptoms maybe that's also an excuse from Arthur Smith to start the better quarterback between the two Heineke had the ninth best EPA plus completion percentage over expected composite rating in week eight among qualified quarterbacks by the way that qualification is I think 20 snaps was, was the input that I threw into RBDSM and This is the interesting part of the handicap for me. Depending on what happens to quarterback for Minnesota, A, I'm curious on your perspective on, is this steam now too high? Even if it is Jaron Hall. B, Vikings blitz a lot, as we touched on last week. The highest blitz rate in the NFL under Brian Flores. Biggest adjustment that Minnesota made from D.C. to now Flores, a defensive coordinator against the 23rd ranked pass block win rate. And this Falcons offensive line is one of the better run block win rates, or I think it's above average across the league, but they haven't passed protected very well. Thoughts on this game, just from the line movement and that individual matchup. Yeah. Really interesting one, obviously because of, we don't know who the hell Minnesota's quarterback is going to be. It could be something Jaron Hall. It could be Nick Mullins coming off IR. Uh, I was reading Sean Mannion is on their practice squad. He's Sean been Mannion. completely dreadful when pressed into duty. Or it could yeah. be some unknown vet they sign or trade for. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think the move is – I was stunned to see minus four. I still think minus four and a half is bettable on the Falcons' end. Um, there's many times, honestly most times, where I'm looking for value on market overcorrections with backup quarterbacks, but – this is a situation where the backup is a guy who doesn't meet the threshold for playing professional quarterback. So I think Kirk Cousins is worth much more than two points or whatever the line moved. I could see this line climbing as high as minus six even, I think. I mean, man, once they announce some bum in there, I just think people are going to go pile in. And if yeah, it is a bomb, or if they make a trade, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. But it's like you said, too. I don't know if I like the matchup of this Vikings defense either. I mean, they want you to get, they want to get you into obvious passing downs and then just blitz the house. That's what they want to do. The problem is that the way Atlanta plays offense, they're not going to face a lot of obvious passing downs. Like they're not going to be in third and seven very often. They're going to be in third and three and they're going to be pounding the rock and. I think that's going to help them in this spot where it'll lo- at least somewhat limit what the Vikings can do, I think. And then, yeah, definitely in my notes, how does Desmond Ritter react to what I, I think is getting benched? I thought that was my hot take, though, but you already said it was. I had that hot take all season that the best quarterback on the roster is Taylor Heineke. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know what that's going to mean for the Falcons offense. And they also lost Grady Jarrett. For the season, which it's a good note. he's one of the best players they have. This is one of the problems, I think, when you have built your team around all 32-year-old linemen. They're more likely to get hurt, although they had a good talent level there. But I, I just, when you watch the Vikings' good performances this year, which was like the 49ers game, and then early in this Packers game, I mean... Kirk Cousins was basically their entire offense. Like that that's the thing about this Vikings team. They they never run the ball. And I guess rightfully so when you have Alexander Madison who stinks, Cam Akers who I don't even know if he's any better to be honest at this point. I would probably call out a passing place too. So I, I don't know where they're going to pivot now on offense. It's certainly not going to be on the back of Jaron Hall, unless Jaron Hall is the second coming of Tom Brady. For anybody that's what that I'm that hearing tweet earlier. That's that's what we're hearing. That's what we're hearing is from the Vikings radio network or the station that the Vikings air their football games on. Redundant, but either way, that was that article earlier today that could Jaron Hall be the next Tom Brady? Well. The market certainly doesn't think so as we could approach six. I don't think that's a crazy assumption. By the way, 
You mentioned Jared out for the rest of the year with that ACL injury. Drake London dealing with the groin injury. I still can't believe whoever that was for Atlanta that dropped that ball. Van Jefferson, who they just traded for, dropped the ball on fourth down. That I mean, Atlanta covers the closing line if they score a touchdown in that possession and if they hold Levis scoreless on the ensuing possession if they wound up scoring. So just some, just food for thought there. You're going to get a pissed off Falcons team at home. I'm not, I don't, I don't think I'm going to bet the game. Even if this gets to six, I don't, I don't think I could touch this game despite the potential mismatch up front. If Atlanta isn't able to sustain their ground game, even without Grady Jarrett on the flip side of the ball, probably a stay away game for me, regardless of how much the market downgrades Minnesota at quarterback. Would you agree? Or do you think this could be a play for you at six or six and a half? I don't think I'm that excited, but if I was going to play it, I think probably Falcons. Um, Even I'd now, be, I'd be curious to see if there's any kind of buyback on Minnesota. But yeah, I don't know, man. You don't want to lay points with this Falcons team, but I, I really think the Vikings might be toasted here. I'm usually finding value in backups, but I don't think these backups are going to have any value, especially with. Kirk Cousins having played pretty well the last few weeks. Like, I, I don't know if they have anybody who can come close to what he's been doing. On to the fourth and final game that we'll be discussing here on the Monday edition of Beat the Closing Number or early week, depending on when you're checking this out. One of the best games on the board. We hit on another AFC clash between the Chiefs and the Dolphins earlier. Buffalo and Cincinnati on Sunday night football rematch of the divisional round. Game where Cincinnati covered and won by three scores, I believe, after closing five, five and a half point dogs in Buffalo. Cincinnati, this line has flipped. Buffalo was minus one and a half on the look ahead. I'm for sure about that, I think. And now it's Cincinnati minus three. So a ton of steam on the Bengals. Total of 48 and a half. Burrow had the highest drop back success rate among any quarterback in week eight, at least as of this recording, unless Jared Goff or somehow Jimmy Garoppolo out does that performance, the fourth most adjusted EPA per play as well. And by the way, just a note for, I found this fascinating just to look at how getting to play Burrow under center completely opened up this offense because entering the game, entering week eight against the Niners, the Bengals ran 4.3% of their snaps under center, offensive snaps, obviously. And in 2021, just just to uh, compare, they ran 38.1% of their snaps under center. So everything opened up for Cincinnati on the ground, for Burrow, his mobility. I mean, he looked like last year's version of Joe Burrow. I, I don't know you you have more follow-up thoughts on that, considering you bet Cincinnati. And just to give a little bit more of a breakdown, of what Burrow is going to face on the other side of the ball from week five onward. And the reason why I'm using that week in particular is because week four, Tredavious White, the Bengals or the Bills number one cornerback tore his ACL. A lot of torn ACLs this season. And the Bills since then have allowed the fourth most EPA per play in the league, only ahead of Green Bay, Washington, and Carolina. I have thoughts on the other side of this in terms of Buffalo's offense against the Bengals defense which got their fair share of positive variance against Brock Purdy. And that also just may have been Brock Purdy and the Cinderella story coming back down to earth. But your takeaways from Burrow and looking like the Burrow of old yesterday against San Francisco lining up against uh, another tasty matchup in this Buffalo defense. Yeah, I mean, I know this is going to sound weird, but similar to how I feel about Will Levis, to be honest, like, they were in a great spot coming off the bye against an injured 49ers team. Yes, I loved the Bengals in that spot. Now, they face one of the best teams in the NFL, which that might sound dumb to some people, but I still think if Josh yeah. Allen plays like he played last week, this is one of the best teams in the NFL. I love the Bills, man. I don't know what we're doing moving this line to Bengals minus three. I know it's cheap minus three, but I don't care. This is crazy to me. They play one good game, and they're suddenly they're minus three. The 49ers still had 8.2 yards per play there, and that was Bengals off a bye. And this time, the Bills are the ones with the rest edge after playing on Thursday. And then you got 
ultra circled factor. The Bills yes. have been waiting this game for 10 months. <laughs> they know the Bengals embarrassed them on their home field to end their season last year. Josh Allen actually was targeting people besides Stefan Diggs last week, which is bad for my fantasy team, but great for the Bills. Okay. He looked good. Yes, he is very good. Yeah. Try spreading the ball around and not giving Diggs 25 targets. I shouldn't be telling them this because I want the Chiefs <laughs> to go to the Super Bowl and not the Bills. But I think, it might, I think it might work. Yeah, the Ravens are they're, they're looking good. But they're alive. I, I think, just to sum it up, I think the Bills are better than the Bengals, and I don't see how they're getting plus three here. They have a better quarterback. Yeah. They have a better defense. Give me the Bills. Give me the Bills money line. So you're putting that in our Discord channel? Absolutely. Are you waiting on it, or are you going to play it after the podcast? Probably right when we're done. I was looking at it right. I cannot believe they moved to three today. I mean, minus two and a half, I could somewhat understand, even though I still think it's wrong. I was still going to bet the Bills. Yeah, I mean, give me the Bills. I'm with you. If I bet this game, which I may, it'll be Buffalo. And to your... To, you know, for our audience that is maybe scratching their heads and saying, how is Buffalo's defense without Tredavious White, without Matt Milano, they did get at, at Oliver back, which made a big difference with their pass rush. How did the Bucks end up covering that game, man? I, I know we hit on it earlier, but I'm still shocked. If there isn't the, the face mask on fourth down, the game's over. But I'm happy you cashed. Technically, they could have won the game is the crazy part. Right. Chris Godwin turns his head around a split second sooner. Tampa Bay upsets Buffalo wild. Then we're we're talking about what? Uh what is Buffalo's record at this point? If they lose that game, then they're they two were back four of and Miami. three, right? I think they right. would have been so, four and four. Yeah, they would have been a four and four Buffalo team. And think about the number we could have gotten on the Bills this week. <laughs> oh my goodness. I wish I wish Tampa Bay had won that game, not just in hindsight. But the Bengals are allowing the 26th, or they rank 26th in, in across the NFL and drop back success rate allowed. I find it very hard to believe, Mo, that Josh Allen, even though he is known for his gunslinging mentality at times, is going to make the same mistakes as Brock Purdy did yesterday. Purdy had the two picks. He also had another two dropped interceptions, and he had one that was called back on their second to last possession which was meaningless, but for anybody that maybe bet San Francisco live may not have been, although that one definitely didn't cash if he did. And he wound up fumbling on the very next play after the interception was called back. So a Purdy is, is not the Cinderella story that many thought he was. I mean, that throw <laughs> on the goal of whatever, the goal to go situation that resulted in a pick that easily could have been a pick six. Josh Allen is not throwing those terrible, terrible balls that Brock Purdy did yesterday, man. Yeah, he played very well against the Bucs. I mean, they basically were marching up and down the field, no problem the entire game. So that was good to see after two very poor performances. Uh, the only bad play basically was that big interception, and that was a tipped ball that, like, yeah, he could have aimed it better and maybe not fired it right into the dude's, you know, jumping arms but it was still kind of a unlucky play so very very excited to get the bills at plus three here i do not understand this line at all i, I mean dude i, I kind of liked the bills last year in the playoff game minus five so i don't know i bet I them live fire i think i bet I, I bet them under a field goal in that game live to be getting three here is is crazy to me by the way i wanted to wrap up with this and even if you don't have a thought just uh state the market the Super Bowl futures market. Kansas City is your favorite to win it all. And by the way, you can find these odds over at thelines.com and Price Shop if you're interested in any of them. Right around a consensus price of plus 500. Philly right behind them. No surprise. So at some books, they're tied for the shortest odds to win it all at plus 500. San Francisco, that's bizarre. Plus 600 to win the Super Bowl. I don't understand the 49ers being ahead of, or even like, Miami really? and Dallas makes sense just because of the result. I would, and this isn't high. This isn't any sort of recency bias. I would have bet Dallas after that game, and I, if between the two teams, if I was to bet either of them, 
And I would bet Dallas right now between the two. And, th- and that, I mean, that, that may seem obvious, but just, just for context, I would have bet them out after the San Francisco game between the two teams. Well, I was reading an article this morning where they were saying, you know, bookmakers still have the 49ers power rated as like the best team in the NFC. Why? Why are they better than the Eagles? I wouldn't necessarily go as far as saying that they're not better than Philly because I do think the market is overvaluing Philly at this point. Me too, uh, for sure. I'm not, I think Jalen Hurts has stunk this year, but I mean, he's, dude, at least Jalen Hurts, even when he stinks, at least he can run for, you know, 50 yards and a touchdown. I mean, the floor is pretty high. Brock Purdy, when he, he has a bad game and these, Turnover worthy plays. I think he's feeling himself a little bit too much and he needs to go back to, you know, just staying within the system and he's trying to do too much. We should know no Debo, no Trent Williams yesterday, the last two games. But that's, and... that's the whole point of this, right? Like once his supporting cast degrades around him, his play falls off a cliff. That's not going to happen with you know, the best players. And he was being compared to the best quarterbacks, which was obviously silly. <laughs> Miami right after San Francisco on the odds board, then Dallas tied at some shops in terms of Miami and Dallas, Baltimore, my Super Bowl features back going back to May at 25 to one. I definitely am happy with that. Then it's the bills at 17 to one. Actually, that's a rogue number 12 is the consensus, let's say. Then Detroit at 15, Cincinnati at 18, and Jacksonville at around 18 to 20 to 1 to win it all. I'm going to throw this question at you, and if you don't have an answer, if you don't think there's any value out there, feel free to state that. If you had to bet one future, one Super Bowl future right now, among those teams, which would it be? Among all teams among or just the teams near Kansas the top? City... Philadelphia, San Francisco, Miami, Dallas, Baltimore, Buffalo, Detroit, Cincinnati, and Jacksonville. Probably Buffalo, since clearly I'm still one of the only ones who believes this is going to be an elite team come playoff time. But it's the same reason, like, after everyone was getting crazy about Philly and San Francisco when they were 5-0, and I'm still ranking the Chiefs and the Bills ahead of them because at the end of the day... When it push comes to shove in the playoffs, I'm riding with Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. I know that maybe these not teams Lamar don't Jackson. have quite as much talent, not Lamar Jackson. I know that these teams maybe don't have quite as much talent as the Eagles and the 49ers top to bottom, but Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen are head and shoulders above the other quarterbacks. That's what I believe. I think everyone obviously knows Patrick Mahomes is, but maybe I drink too much Josh Allen Kool-Aid. I don't know. Maybe I focus on all the Josh Allen good games and give him too much leeway for maybe being injured last year, but I still think he's easily the second best quarterback in the NFL. That's Mo Noir. You can follow him on Twitter at Mo Noir, two W's. You can follow me on Twitter at Eli Herskovich. And you can follow the lines on Twitter at the lines US. Remember, if you're betting any NFL week nine action, first time users with BetMGM Sportsbook can use bonus code the lines to get up to $1,500 back in bonus bets. If your first bet loses, that's promo code the lines one word and terms and conditions apply as always. Remember that bonus bets are not equivalent to real money. We have plenty of free contests with Amazon gift cards to boot. Play.thelines.com if you're interested. And World Series, we are giving away gift cards there too. NBA, college basketball tips off next week. As I alluded to, my power ratings are up at thelines.com. So be sure to check all of that out. Most Survivor Guide for Week 9. If you're still alive and your Survivor Pool is up on the homepage as well. Mo, any last words before we get out of here? Nope, other than uh, I'm excited for this week. Really, really nice slate of games, man. Yeah, well, besides, eh, you say that. I thought you were saying that in just kind of. No, besides, there's like four great games. Four great games, and then what about the rest? Who cares? Put those on the side TV. Side TV. I don't... In the, on the early slate besides Seattle and Baltimore, what interests you? You have... You have Minnesota, Atlanta, Arizona, Cleveland, the Rams, 
and the Packers, the Commanders and Patriots, the Bears and the Saints. You're a glass and- half empty type of guy I can see. I'm trying to be positive here and focus on the four great games on the schedule, okay? <laughs> I'll give you props. I usually have a negative negative person. All right. That's Mo. I'm Eli. Thanks for watching and listening to another edition of Beat the Closing Number. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple, Spotify, all that good stuff. We're having a good NFL season. Hope you're cashing along with us. Thanks for watching and listening. So long, everybody.